Welcome back to PHI, Public Health Impact. I'm Cham Dallas. And I'm Phaedra Corso. In today's show, we're going to be talking about evidence-based practice. Yes, evidence-based practice is an academic concept that we want to take to the real world, where you have uh, the use of current best practices or the best evidence in making decisions about individual patients. Ah, so I get it. You have a cough, you go into your doctor's office, and evidence-based practice helps that doc doctor figure out, do I give this person antibiotics or do I give them a, a chest x-ray? That's right. A lot of physicians and other healthcare personnel, they, they have been doing a certain practice, a certain procedure, because it feels good or they, that's the way they've always done it or I just know it works for me. You hear that a lot. Well, we find out that the evidence often says otherwise. Mm -hmm. And today we're going to be talking to the co-directors of the Institute for Evidence-Based Health Professions Education here at UGA. And the co-directors are Dr. Ronald Cervero from the College of Education and Dr. Mark Abel from the College of Public Health. So we have two colleges cross-cutting on this very important issue. And Cham, we're also going to have a guest from Speech and Communication Pathology. She's on the advisory board for the Institute and she's going to talk to us about how evidence-based practice works for her. So evidence-based practice aims to share knowledge with best practices. Which are then used to serve patients, which if we think about how that applies to public health, if you're receiving good care at the individual level and we all receive that good care, then we end up having good population level health. The point is to stay ahead of the research. As the research continues, we keep inquiring into the nature of things and stay with the best available practices. So stay with us as we explore further evidence-based practice. We're now going to take a closer look at the Institute for Evidence-Based Health Professions and I'm being joined by the co-directors. On my far right, I have Dr. Mark Abel, who is a medical doctor and associate professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostats in the College of Public Health. Welcome. Mm -hmm. And we also have Dr. Ronald Severo, who is a professor and associate dean in the College of Education. So thank you both so much for joining me today. Um, my first question is for you, Ron. Um, tell me a little bit about how the Institute was created. Well, Mark and I were both committed to the idea of evidence-based practice and how it could improve patient care for the citizens of Georgia. And we decided to see who else was interested around the university, and turns out there's lots of other uh, faculty members in a variety of colleges here. So we brought everyone together and decided to move forward with this concept. Okay, great, and when we use the term evidence based healthcare or evidence-based medicine. What does that exactly mean, Mark? Well, it means that we're trying to base decisions about what we do to and for patients on the best available research. And a lot of times we base our care on what we've always done or what we think might be correct or what we were taught a long time ago. Um, but evidence-based practice tries to make sure we're doing the things that help people live longer, better lives. And what are the overall goals of the Institute? Well, because we're at the University of Georgia and the three uh, parts of the university mission, first of all, we're committed to fostering evidence-based practice through our professional education programs in our health professions colleges. Secondly, we're committed to interdisciplinary research about evidence-based practice and what we can learn to improve our knowledge in this area. And finally, we are committed to working with practitioners across the state of Georgia to help them use evidence-based practice and provide training for evidence-based practice in the clinical settings. And so who are some of the partners that the Institute has to, to, to do this type of work? Right, well, when we started this effort, we were surprised to find out that in the, at the University of Georgia, there are about 350 faculty members uh, across the various colleges, and that includes the College of Pharmacy, the Co uh, School of Social Work, the College of Public Health, the College of Education, the College of Veterinary Medicine, and the Foods and Nutrition Program in the College of Family and Consumer Sciences, as well as the uh, Georgia Health Sciences University UGA Medical Partnership that has a branch campus here uh, at the University of Georgia. So Mark, let's switch um, to talking about health professionals in particular. Can you give me an example of how the Institute is going about um, training health professionals? Well, we've started to develop a series of webinars that um, health professionals around the state uh, can view. That's in conjunction with the Georgia Public Health Training Center here at the University of Georgia. 
and we're also developing a master's degree in education with an emphasis on health professions. So somebody who's teaching in a residency or a training program or wants to do a better job of learning how to teach other health professionals, we're going to hopefully be able to give them those skills. So what has the evidence told us so far about adult learning? Well, here's what we know, and there's been a lot of evidence about how adults learn, and health professionals are like all other adults. So first of all, they, we, we need to focus on clinical problems, the kind of problems and patient issues they see in their daily practice. Uh, secondly, we know that we need to focus that the learning activity itself needs to be authentic. It needs to be like the kind of patient encounter they uh, will have experienced. And finally, and maybe most importantly, it needs to be active learning. They don't, we don't like them to just be sitting there listening to lectures, but we like them to be actively engaged with the teacher or the facilitator in that learning process. Yeah, they have lots of questions, but they don't always get answered. And when they get answered, they don't always get answered with the best available evidence. So we really think that's a great way to figure out taking what physicians have told us they don't know and using that to build continuing education. And we're hoping to move that over into a study in the veterinary world, and so we're going to be doing the same thing with veterinarians, uh, never been done before. So what kind of questions does a vet have as they're seeing their clients throughout the day, and how can we help improve their education as well? Well, that's a good summary of the Institute, and uh, next we'll be talking about the clinical side of evidence-based practice. I need a really clear definition of okay. what is evidence-based practice. Yeah. When a healthcare provider makes a decision about ordering a test or ordering a treatment for a patient, we want to make sure that they base that decision on the best available, least biased research evidence and that they integrate that with the patient's values. That they're not basing it on just what they've always done or what they've heard about or what they think might work, but what actually has been proven to work. Well, so how does a provider find that evidence? I mean, where, where is it in a book somewhere? I mean, where does it exist? Yeah, increasingly we're not looking in books. You know, we're looking online like, like anyone else uh, who wants to answer a question. We turn to the online sources first. Uh, increasingly we have references that are summaries of the evidence and they're designed to, to do just that, to filter the evidence and focus on the best designed studies. There are a lot of bad studies out there. There are 800,000 studies published every year that can't all be good. Uh, only a few hundred should really change physician practice. And so we are trying to develop tools that help physicians find those key studies that should change their practice. So I know that another very important focus for you is the reporting of patient-oriented outcomes. What mm -hmm. does that term mean and why is it so important? Patient-oriented outcomes are things a patient would care about. Um, you know, I have high blood pressure myself and what I care about, the reason I take a medication for it is because I want to prevent strokes and heart attacks and I want to live longer. Uh, I don't take it to necessarily make a number look different, a blood pressure number. I take it because I want to live longer or better. And that's what patient-oriented outcomes are. Disease-oriented outcomes are things like uh, a blood pressure or a blood sugar. And we know from lots of studies that merely improving a number like that doesn't always translate into better patient-oriented outcomes. And so why is it the case that, pa that um, providers or physicians haven't always focused on patient-oriented outcomes? It just seems like that would be the obvious thing. Well, a lot of the research that's out there doesn't focus on them. There's a lot of research uh, and it's easier to do the kind of research that just proves in a month or two that a drug lowers a blood pressure or lowers your blood sugar. It's harder and more expensive, but ultimately really important to do the research that proves that a medication is safe and effective in the long haul and improves those patient-oriented outcomes. All right, so let's bring it back to practice now. Give me an example where um, where the practice is not necessarily consistent with the best evidence. Yeah. Well, I'm sitting here about two octaves lower than normal because mm -hmm. I have a bronchitis. And, uh, but if you're you, not infectious, right? Absolutely <laughs> not, I guarantee. But if you uh, go seek care from a physician in this country, and we've done big studies on this, uh, 60 to 70 percent of the time, six to seven out of ten times, you're going to get an antibiotic. Yet all the research shows us that in otherwise healthy adults, these bronchitis episodes that are mostly caused by viruses don't respond to antibiotics. We're giving a lot of antibiotics out, we're causing a lot of resistance, but we're not helping patients feel better. So how do you see the physicians of the future, the ones that we're training now, um, being able to answer these important clinical questions? 
Well, increasingly physicians are using electronic health records. Mm -hmm. Part of the Affordable Care Act was uh, designed to help encourage that. Uh, it'll pay doctors a little less if they're not using an EHR and a little more if they are. Uh, it hopefully will catch up to other countries where 80 to 90 percent of physicians use an electronic health record. Here we're about 30 percent or so. Uh, I think over the next five years as doctors have that screen uh, accessible to them as they have the patient information they'll be able to access those answers more quickly. But isn't one of the problems with the ele electronic health records is not that you don't have it within your own environment but you don't necessarily have that cross link to the other providers for the patient so you know mm -hmm. what are we going to do to kind of cross that bridge? What I'm talking about has more to do with an individual provider and the questions that they have as they're caring for that patient. And people have done research on what's called an info button. Uh, basically, it's a button uh, in the electronic health record that pulls in a little information about the patient and then goes out and finds an answer that's tailored toward that patient. Mm -hmm. Um, certainly, uh, we want to do more to, to link healthcare providers so we're not so siloed, uh, and that's one of the challenges of electronic health records is making sure all those systems can communicate. So if you see your family doctor, I'm a family physician, uh, that my notes and my decisions get communicated to their cardiologist um, and their rheumatologist as well. So you brought up the Affordable Care Act, so I want to you know, challenge you on this for one mm -hmm. second. So we all heard that there, you know, the, the Affordable Care Act, when it was being written, had some language in there that would provide reimbursements to physicians who wanted to sit down with patients and talk about end-of-life care, and it became a big scandal. Yes. What are your thoughts on what, what happened there? Well, it's really unfortunate. Um, we, I did research uh, a little while ago that showed that about half of patients uh, have talked to their spouses or talk to their family members, and this is just general population, about end-of-life care issues. People care about this. They want uh, to make sure that their wishes and their values are respected as they near the end of life, but o only maybe 10 percent have talked to a health care provider about those same wishes. Uh, so I think we need to do everything we can to get people to talk to their doctor uh, about their wishes and make sure that they're respected, and we're doing some work to help facilitate that at the Institute. Great. And have them be reimbursed for those discussions as well, right? That would be nice. So um, tell us a little more about the research that you're doing in the Institute. Yeah, I just mentioned the project to do with um, uh, end-of-life care. Uh, one of the questions is, well, if I'm near the end of life and I have cardiopulmonary resuscitation, my heart stops or I stop breathing and they try to get me going again, mm -hmm. uh, what are the chances that I'll survive and be able to go home and, and live independently? Uh, so we're developing uh, clinical models and decision support tools to help uh, physicians and patients understand do they have a, a better than average or worse than average outcome, what can they expect. We're also developing online tools so a patient can go and learn more about just what uh, C CPR, cardiopulmonary resuscitation, means. Uh, we found previous research by others has shown that most people think that about 60 percent of people survive to leave the hospital after a code. That's based on television shows. Mm -hmm. uh, they're also all good-looking and young and uh, healthy, and uh, in reality it's more like 15 percent, so it's about one-fourth as many. So do your models take into account the size of the person and the age of the person? So like I'm thinking a frail elderly woman might yeah. not be able to be resuscitated as easily as, a, as the young good-looking person as you mentioned. Yeah, you know, they're uh, Sex ends up not making a big difference. Age can be an important factor, but not really even as important as we think. There's still people in their 70s who are very healthy and vigorous and will do well. Um, it has more to do with the underlying illnesses. If someone has uh, widespread cancer or kidney disease, um, that decreases their likelihood of benefiting from CPR. So it seems that there's you know, a need to assist um, the patients as well and the mm -hmm. caregivers to make these um, informed decisions. So is your research addressing that area as well? Yeah, we're, we just uh, submitted a grant to try to get a better idea of when patients think that care is futile. When would a patient think mm -hmm. that care is no longer helpful, no longer beneficial? Uh, so we think that the patient values are just absolutely central to this. As a physician or as a researcher, we can bring the data about what on average they can expect to happen, but ultimately two different people might make very different, equally good decisions based on their values. Mm -hmm. So I got to ask you about 
the barrage of health information mm -hmm. that we hear about every day. So, you know, thinking about how much wine is good, not too good, how often should we be getting mammography screening, vitamin E. I just think as a consumer, um, as a patient, we don't know what to do because mm -hmm. we just get hit with these different media messages. What, what does the evidence-based practice have to say about that? Yeah, I think a lot of the time, the, the message, the mixed messages are because there's been a focus on studies that were not very well designed, uh, not necessarily intentionally, but just they weren't the kind of study that could definitively answer a question. Hormone replacement is a good example. For a long time, we had not very good studies um, telling us that hormone replacement was a good thing for almost every woman out there. And when we did better quality studies that were less biased, uh, we found out that that wasn't the case. And a lot of the studies early on looked at these disease-oriented outcomes. So they looked at cholesterol levels and free radical levels and blood pressure levels and things that are ultimately not what we care about as much as those patient-centered outcomes. When they finally did those studies, uh, we got an answer that was different. And then, of course, we had been telling women one thing for 30 years, now we had to change the message, and that's very upsetting, understandably, and, and a little disconcerting, too. But, but what kind of advice can you give to patients yeah. when they go see their provider and they walk in having all these mixed messages? Yeah, I think always ask yourself, what's the evidence that doing this will help me live better or longer? Not that it changes a number, but what's the evidence, how good is the evidence that it'll help me live better or longer? I think that's always a question, especially for uh, high value decisions. If you're really making an important decision, you're going to be on a medicine for 30 years or 20 years, mm -hmm. which is often the case, you know, that's an important decision. You want to make sure you really understand the pros and cons. So tell us about some other research you're doing in evidence-based practice. Yeah, we're doing several studies on respiratory tract infections. Uh, just finishing one up where we asked 500 people around Georgia, how long do you think an episode of cough or acute bronchitis lasts? And most people say six or seven days. And then we looked at the literature and systematically reviewed it. And the best evidence says it's more like two weeks or even a little longer. So we think that's an important mismatch. If folks aren't feeling better after four or five days, they often seek an antibiotic, which isn't going to be helpful, but then they might think it helped because then they start getting better uh, a week later. Uh, we're also doing work on diagnosing influenza better. So we have developed a simple clinical scoring tool for symptoms uh, that help identify people who are at low or high risk of influenza. And we, we hope to link that with CDC data on how much flu is in your community to help people make a better self-care decision and also help their physician make better decisions. Well, so let me ask you about the influenza. Isn't there a test that proves whether you have influenza or not? There are some rapid tests that we can do in the office. Uh, the really good test is called PCR, but that takes several days to get back, so that's too late to do anything with. Okay. The in-office tests aren't very good. Uh, they only detect about two-thirds of people who have the flu, and they also will tell about one in ten people who doesn't have the flu that they have it. So it's not a very good test. Our goal is to limit the use of that test to the people where it's going to be most helpful. Um, ideally, we'd like to use just information from the history, from the physical, mm -hmm. to either rule out flu or to say it's so likely that if you're within 24 hours, you might want to consider flu medicine. And so I imagine that will also save money in the long run if you're not having to do those tests unnecessarily. It might. I mean, I, the primary goal isn't saving money, but in evidence-based practice, often if you do the right thing and if you do what the evidence uh, tells you and where it guides you, uh, often it will be more efficient and will save money. So my final question for you is, what do you see the long-term impact of the Institute being? Well, hopefully we can improve the uh, uh, education of physicians and patients about what evidence-based practice means and also help us do a better job of how we teach about evidence-based practice and how we get it into practice. As Ron said, adults don't learn very well sitting in a classroom uh, in front of a lecture or in front of a chalkboard. Uh, PowerPoints put me to sleep. <laughs> so we have to do a better job of building our education into the point of care, the place where care is being delivered so that healthcare providers can learn as they care for their patients. Great. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I'd like you now to meet Dr. Ann Bothy Marcotte. She is a professor in communication sciences disorders, and she's also on the advisory board for the Institute. Ann, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your research? I work in stuttering, which is a disorder of speech motor production that also influences how people feel about their lives. 
I've done some research in treatment with children and done some research in treatment with adults as well as some stuff about oh measuring stuttering and less interesting things like that. Wonderful and so let me just ask how did you get involved with evidence-based practice? Oh I always tell people I've always been involved in evidence-based practice um, by which I mean that way back when I was in my first master's program we were taught to figure out what the research is and base our treatments on that. So my profession, uh, communication disorders or speech language pathology, has grown from there. And um, as the name evidence-based medicine and then evidence-based practice became more familiar to other people, um, we've changed a bit what we mean by what we used to call research-based practice. Mm -hmm. um, so it, short answer, I've always been involved in evidence-based or research-based therapies. And so for evidence-based practice in your line of research and stuttering, who mm -hmm. is it exactly for? Is it for physicians only? Not for physicians at all, and that's actually one of the interesting pieces that I think I can add to this whole conversation, which is that evidence-based practice is not just about physicians or about the prescriptions that a physician might give. Those of us who are speech therapists or occupational therapists or physical therapists or social workers or educators, teachers of any sort, um, can also be working from the evidence base in their fields, and that's what we try to do in the therapies as opposed to in medicine. So is it the case that these non-physician groups are also being trained in the use of evidence-based practice as part of their, like, their clinical training? Oh, absolutely, yes. I, I think uh, certainly in our own, uh, the speech and hearing clinic here at UGA, where mm -hmm. our master's students practice, they do evidence-based practice. They're taught to combine the research evidence with the client's preferences and with the clinician's expertise, that, that triad of what evidence-based practice really means. Our students are taught to combine that, and that's how they're how they're expected to go practice. So in all of your um, years of research in this area and evidence-based practice, what are some of the, the biggest challenges you've seen in, in, in practitioners actually using evidence-based practice? Oh, lots of challenges. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, one of the biggest challenges I would say is that practitioners, if I talk about speech therapists in particular, because that's what I know, speech therapists like to help people. And so if you have tried something and it helped a child once, you tend to want to do it again whether it's really the best choice or not. And so the challenge then is for practitioners to read the research and recognize that there might be something even better. Because once you've seen something good once, um, that's a good outcome, that's wonderful. We want to be able to help a child, but we'd rather know why and be able to help more children more efficiently and maybe even more effectively moving into the future. Right, so what kind of advice would you give to um, patients when they go in to see their provider and they're being offered a new treatment therapy, what kind of advice can you give so that they can also be have a meaningful conversation about the evidence? I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to just ask why. And I don't mean to say that we should be challenging anybody who's giving us advice. I wouldn't want uh, people to be challenging their physicians or their speech therapists or anybody mm -hmm. else. But I, I think it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask why are you recommending this? And also, is there anything else that we could do and why aren't we doing that? I think those are perfectly reasonable questions. And a good therapist, and I, we tell students this, a good therapist should be able to have a good answer to that. So if a client says, mm -hmm. why are you recommending that we do this sort of treatment, the therapist should be very comfortable saying, well, I'll tell you why. It's because the research suggests it's probably the best for people like you, and I think it would be a good fit for you. Great. Well, thank you so much for that very helpful explanation of evidence-based practice. You're very welcome. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit more about the Institute. Um, are you all planning to host any events, future events? Sure. We have had for the last two years a monthly seminar and have had an annual conference. I think that um, your listeners could go to our website, which is www.ebp uga.edu and we have a full listing of, of uh, podcasts from our prior events that are, are easily accessible there. Okay, and are those annual conferences open to the public? Absolutely open to the public and, and we, one of our goals for the future of course is to increase participation in our events and, and certainly the conference is one of those. Uh, we'll be putting out information uh, about that in, coming up. And if I'm a healthcare provider and want to, to get some training um, what's available on your website? Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, if they want just 
these uh, lectures around evidence-based practice, they can download those and listen to them very easily. We will have uh, modules on there related to some areas of evidence-based medicine that uh, Mark has, has done. And we will be having modules around uh, education and how we can improve education related to evidence-based practice. And how can students get involved with the Institute? Well, that's a great question because we, one of the goals again for the future is to involve more students as well as faculty. So we certainly invite them to our seminars, we invite them to our conference. We hope ultimately that we will be fostering evidence-based practice in our professional education programs. So they will be experiencing uh, evidence-based practice in their in their initial training and hopefully we'll be able to continue that once they get out into practice. Great, thank you. Today's episode highlighted the evolution of health care and the forces that are helping to bring this to pass. And we learned that there's evidence-based practice research going on in all areas of health care. And the goal is to get it to the patients that need it the most and to the health care providers, all of them, that need to deliver it. Yeah, so the end result is that we'll have more meaningful, informative conversations between patients and providers. And that should result in better health care for all of us. So join us for the next episode of PHI, Public Health Impact.